I'd like to do is ask you now, because I've got just an ample amount of questions relating to the distant starlight challenge, mm -hmm. all asked in slightly different ways. And so why don't we just engage that in general, Dr. Lau? What do you believe is the best solution to the so-called distant starlight problem? Yeah, I think it's what I've called the the ASK model, anisotropic synchrony convention model, um, which basically goes back to the fact that the speed of light in any one direction is not measurable without first assuming it either directly or indirectly, tacitly. That's something that Albert Einstein wrote about. He knew about that. It's called the conventionality thesis. There's even a decent Wikipedia article on it, believe it or not, that's actually pretty accurate. That's not always the case, but in that case it is. And basically the speed of light from A to B, you can't measure. You can only measure the speed of light from A to B and back and take the average speed. And most people say, well, why wouldn't it be the same speed out as, as in? Uh, because that leads to inconsistencies. If it's the same speed out rather, and in relative to one observer, it won't be relative to another observer. And so what Einstein did was he said, I'm just gonna stipulate the speed of light in one direction and that'll tell me what now means at a distance. And so I can use that to synchronize my clocks. And then because it leads to inconsistencies, he said other, other observers will have different definitions of now, different definitions of simultaneity. And so that's something that you would learn in a freshman level class on uh, Einstein, on the physics of relativity, what we call relativity, is that different observers that are in motion relative to each other have different surfaces of simultaneity. Um, but one of the things you can do is you can define the inward speed of light to be instantaneous to be infinity basically, as long as the outward c speed is half C, where C is the round trip speed of light. Or, uh, yeah, and so, and because the average has to be C. The bottom line is, if you use that convention, and I'm not saying that's the only convention, but I am saying it's the one the Bible probably uses. In that convention, it takes, it takes light no time at all to get from the distant stars to earth using that time stamping procedure. And that's the one that all ancient cultures used it wasn't until relatively modern times that we that Einstein basically said, let's let the speed of light be this, you know, out at sea and in at sea. And that means we're seeing not the present, but we're seeing the past and how far out you look is how back, how far back in time you're looking. I'm not saying that's wrong, by the way. I'm just saying that you're, it's also not wrong to say, no, we're seeing the universe in real time. Uh, the light travels here immediately using these, this visual synchrony convention that I believe the Bible uses. And there's good evidence that the Bible does use this ancient convention uh, in Genesis 1 when God makes the lights and the firmament, the sun, the moon, the stars also. He makes them to give light on the earth. That's one of their purposes is to, to, to give light on the earth. And the Bible says, and it was so, which implies that they immediately began giving light on the earth. Uh, immediately, uh, as soon as they were created on day four, they fulfilled their God-ordained purpose, or at least within 24 hours, to give light upon the earth. And so that suggests the visual synchrony convention. And it, it bothers people that they think, well, the speed of light in one direction, it's either this or that. Uh, but it yeah. turns out the physics of Einstein does not allow for it to be either this or that. It has to be both and. It, it's whatever you stipulate it to be. And therefore, there is no distant starlight problem if, if the Bible is using a visual synchrony convention. It means we're seeing the universe in real time, even today. Not that the alternative is wrong. It's just not what the Bible's using. So that's that's my elevator speech on the end. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> hope that's somewhat comprehensible. No, it's great. And, and I think it's a good way to uh, relate it to that. If you're stuck in an elevator for a couple of minutes with someone and they want to know, how do we answer the distant starlight challenge? What, what's a good way to respond? So if I'm understanding you correctly, basically we're seeing the universe, everything in the universe, even the most distant stars and galaxies in real time mm -hmm. using this visual synchrony convention Yep, because light's arriving instantaneously, which is consistent with the physics of Einstein. It absolutely is. That's what surprises people. But Einstein wrote yeah. about that. He knew about that. I've got oh. your book behind me, The Physics of Einstein, which I recommend people people check out. In Extremely interesting book. Uh, Sam, you had a follow-up, brother? Yeah, there, there was a paper a while back, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, where a supernova was observed and the light traveling towards us from the supernova hit a planetesimal, and it traveled around one side faster than the other side. And so from this paper, it was suggested that this shows that we can know that these the one-way speed of light is 
is um i guess this is constant this is the same as the uh, half, half of the two-way speed of light you familiar okay with yeah that? Yeah, I am. I'm familiar with that. Yeah. So I don't think the, if, if memory serves, I don't think the author suggested that that proves the one way speed of light, but rather secularists jumped on that and said it proves yeah. the one way speed of light. Um, so what happened is that, yeah, so there's a supernova exploding star really far, far away and, and it gets very, very bright for, for a period of a month or two. And the light passed by, it didn't hit a planetesimal, but rather it it passed by a, ga a galaxy cluster, a cluster of galaxies. Okay. And the gravity from all those galaxies bent the light. And, and it bent, you know, and so some of the light went above the galaxy cluster, some of it went around to the side and bent, and then some of it went to the other side and bent, and some of it went below and got bent up. And so what we, what we received on Earth was light coming from four different directions. And so we saw four different images of this mm -hmm. one supernova that had traveled different directions around the galaxy. It was, it was amazing. Uh, it's neat to see. And then about a year later, a fifth image appeared. There was light that took a longer journey and got bent around in this direction. And so we saw a fifth image of that same supernova. And people have said, see, that means the speed of light's non-instantaneous. Uh, well, I, I never denied that the speed of light is non-instantaneous unless it's moving directly toward you. Hmm. It's only in the, anisotrop in, in the anisotropic synchrony convention, only light that is moving directly toward you is instantaneous. There is an equation. I've written down the equation. It's it's um, c over one minus the cosine of theta, where theta is the the direction away from the, um, directly toward you, and um, that that tells you what the speed of light is in different directions. Remember, it's half c when it's moving away from you. It's c yeah. when it's perpendicular, and it's infinity when it's toward you. But if you think of the different legs of that journey, the the, the light first has to go up a little bit to then get bent around the galaxy to then move directly toward Earth. So when it's moving in this direction, it's not moving directly toward Earth. It has to get bent to that direction. And so its speed will be slower. And so the anisotropic synchrony convention predicts that the fifth supernova image, because the light deviates more from a straight line, it will be traveling slower in this direction until it gets bent directly toward us. And then it speeds up to essentially infinity. Uh, so we would we would also predict that the fifth image would appear a year later, and that has to be the case because the Einstein synchrony convention, the stipulation of the speed of light is the same in all directions, and the yeah. anisotropic syn synchrony convention, which stipulates its infinity toward you and one half c away, they're coordinate systems, and therefore they have to predict the exact same observable phenomena. That they'll differ on what coordinates we assign to it, but. If, if two asteroids are predicted to collide under the Einstein synchrony convention, they'll be predicted to collide under the anisotropic synchrony convention. They predict the, ex the exact same observable phenomena. And that was proved by John Winnie back in uh, 1970, I think, maybe 60s. Is this the uh, mis misconception or argument that Dr. Hugh Ross used in your most recent yes. discussion? Okay. And, yeah, and he had the same misconception. He was thinking, he was thinking that Ask means the speed of light, the one-way speed of light's the same no matter what the direction. No, it's only when it's moving directly toward the observer. And so for the first leg of the trip, the speed of, the, the speed of light would have been slow. It wouldn't have been instantaneous because the light mm. is traveling not directly toward Earth. It has to go up above the galaxy or below or to the left or the right. So yeah, Hugh Ross had, had made that same assumption. So if this is what, on. yeah, you did a great job. So if Hugh Ross in your debate utilize that if he thought that would be a good challenge directly in, in your discussion to use against your your model on distant starlight is this really the best they got then because it seems like you're easily addressing it yeah um i don't think there's a good i don't think there's a good uh, challenge to this and i have mm -hmm. to i have to back up a little bit the the anisotropic synchrony convention is a convention it will never be refuted because it's a coordinate system it's like trying to refute right. the metric system you can't do that it's a, yeah. it's a way of assigning numbers to something and so that'll never be refuted. People have tried. I had a guy try recently and I responded, uh, uh, Phil Dennis tried to refute the conventionality thesis. And I responded on the website showing that he had made some false assumptions. Um, his was kind of mathematical, but it's still, it's still the same, it's still the same uh, fallacious reasoning. Now I have made the claim, and this is falsifiable, that the Bible is using that coordinate system. That, that could be true or it could be false, right? That's not a convention. That's a, that's a factual claim. I think it's true. That mm -hmm. could be refuted. I don't think it will be. I think there's good evidence that um, the Bible uses the ancient method of defining when something happens by when we see the light arrive. Every ancient culture did that. It wasn't until modern times we began subtracting off 
a hypothetical light travel time by stipulating its one-way speed to be C. So yeah, so I don't think anybody will ever refute the conventionality thesis or the ASC coordinate system, but the model is theoretically falsifiable. It just hasn't been falsified yet because I think it's a good right. model. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciate that you've engaged the critics in video form, in written form, and also in several interviews that you've done. And so here's a skeptic who's been wanting to challenge your model here. And so he's, he sent this in advance. And I think, or wait, not that one, let me see. Uh, I think you kind of just addressed it actually, but let's let's leave no stone unturned. So right here, Mr. Anderson. And so he, he says this, it's a two-parter, we'll work through it. He says, you say that it is impossible to measure the one-way speed of light, but also that you believe it is in infinite coming toward us, which means we see the stars as they are. And part two of his question here, the speed of light coming towards us is instantaneous. We can see distant starlight to synchronize clocks and accurately measure the one-way speed of, speed of light. Which is it? Immeasurable so, or not? Yeah, it's um, it, it's not measurable without first assuming it. You can you can presuppose it because it's not it's not a question of nature. It's a stipulation which I can make of my own free will in order to arrive at a definition of simultaneity. So if I stipulate the speed of light to be instantaneous toward me, I can use that to synchronize my clocks. And then when I measure the speed of light using my synchronized clocks, I'll find it's exactly what I stipulated it to be. And so, but you can do that with you can you can do that with any synchrony convention. You can say I want the speed of light to be three fourths c this way, and whatever it is in the remaining trip, and and synchronize your clocks that way, and then measure it. But you see how that's circular. Um, you you can't you can't independently measure the one way speed of light without first assuming it, and that's because it's not, as Einstein put it, the the speed of light in one direction. He said is not. In real, is in reality neither a supposition nor a hypothesis about the physical nature of light, but a stipulation which I can make of my own free will in order to arrive at a definition of simultaneity. That's in his 1916 uh, book on relativity. So you might check that out. That's good. That's really good. And so uh, right here just came in, based on what we were talking about earlier, you recommended a paper, Green green pea galaxies, I think it was uh, a specific yeah. point. And so th this viewer said that he uh, went and, and looked it over a little bit. So he's, he's got a follow-up question. Okay. And he's, he's asking, why did uh, Dr. Lyle imply that these green pea galaxies were more distant red shifts of Z14 with high metallicity? Metallicities. Metallicities, there we go. Metallicities when they're really Z8. Oh, okay, um, I didn't mean to. If I if you got that impression, I apologize. But they are part of the James Webb Space Telescope data, and and you need to understand that in terms of distance, Z versus eight versus C, uh, Z versus fourteen, it's not tremendously different in terms of distance or time. It gets more compressed as you get closer to higher and higher Z. So my point was simply that we have very high redshifted galaxies that, according to the Big Bang view, are um, extremely early in the universe. And yet they have metallicities that are comparable to nearby galaxies. So those galaxies, I, if memory serves, they're within the first billion years of the universe. And they're comparable to 10 billion year old galaxies in terms of their metallicity. That's the point I was trying to make. So I apologize if, if, if I miscommunicated. No, you did a good job. I appreciate that. Okay, on the distant starlight argument, you know, even myself pretending to be a critic, I can't think of really any real challenge or refutation that you haven't addressed or engaged. And so, and, and we've uh, addressed a lot of what the critics are saying here.